Eric Valley is a photographer for National Geographic. And he was sent on a trip to Nepal uh, to film in the Himalayan mountains a group of people called the Honey Hunters. This is one of the pictures that he took. These people are amazing. They live up in the Himalayan mountains, as I said, and these bees build these massive nests on the cliff sides. And you can see he's, he's hanging by a rope ladder. And below him is nothing for 400 feet. He's 400 feet above the ground. So Eric Valley, the photographer, had to go down one of these rope ladders and take this picture. When he got down there, these honey hunters, as you can see, take a stick and they knock the honeycomb into the basket. That does not make the bees happy. The bees swarm, thousands of bees are swarming. And here is Eric Valley, the photographer, about as close as I am to this. He's hanging from a rope ladder 400 feet above the earth and he's got a thousand bees swarming all around him. He said he was so panicked, he almost lost it. But had he, had he done that, he would have fallen to his death. And so what he had to do was to be still. He had to, he had to completely relax in that setting. Can you imagine relaxing in that setting? That's what he had to do. He had to get completely still. And once he was able to do that, he took this award-winning photograph. You know how many times the Bible tells us to be still? Over and over again. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. It tells us to, to rest in the Lord and be still. It tells us to abide in Christ to remain in him over and over again. And I believe it's one of the hardest things for us to do is to do nothing, to be still. David talks about this in Psalm 40. And he begins with a verse that gives us some very simple instructions. But even though they're simple, it doesn't mean it's easy. In verse 1, he said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me, and he heard my cry. David waited patiently. The Hebrew word is often translated long-suffering. That's what God is like with us. He waits patiently with us. He's a, a long-suffering God. He puts up with so much from us for so long. And fortunately for me and, and for you, he, God is a, is a long-suffering God. He, he waits patiently for us. But David says that he has to wait patiently on the, for the Lord. And I do believe it's one of the things that we, are, we do the worst is waiting patiently. We hate to wait. We don't like to wait in traffic. We don't like to wait in lines at the, at the grocery store or on the drive through We don't like to wait for anything. And so when he tells us to wait patiently for the Lord, it's not something that comes naturally to us. But when we wait patiently for the Lord, those who do, do not wait in vain. Because look what he says. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. Eventually, God answered his prayer. But the, diff the thing about it was, it was always in God's time. And see, we, this is what happens to us. We, we pray and we want an instant answer to our prayers. That's We're an instant society. We want everything to be instant. David waited patiently for the Lord and he prayed and in God's perfect time, he turned to him and he heard his cry. We are taught that we have to grab the bull by the horns and make things happen. That's part of our society. And from the time that we're young, we're taught that you don't just sit back. You've got to get out there and be aggressive and be assertive and make things happen. And it's so much a part of our thinking and I think particularly in our American culture, it's so much a part of our thinking that the idea of sitting back and doing nothing is just foreign to us. We don't, we don't even understand that kind of thinking. And it's the thing that we do the worst. Why is it so hard for us to be patient and to wait patiently? A few years ago at a missions conference at another church, uh, Carol and I had a, a, a 
missionary couple stay at our house. It was Joe and Maria Howard. They had been ministering in uh, West Mali, Africa to a tribe called the Bozos. We had a lot of fun with that, but <laughs> that's another story. They were Bozos for Christ over there in West Mali. And, but they told us that they, were, they spent 17 years as missionaries in West Mali before they had their first convert to Jesus Christ. 17 years. I know when you go off on your missions trips uh, now, you're hoping that as soon as you get there, you're going to have a chance to lead somebody to Jesus. And, and certainly before the trip is over, you want to lead someone to Jesus. But imagine if you go over there and that doesn't happen in the first week or the first year or the first 17 years. Are you going to wait patiently for the Lord? Are you going to trust him that in his perfect time he's going to use you and he's going to, the people are going to come to Christ? David waited patiently for the Lord. In verse 2, we see one of the results of waiting patiently for the Lord. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. When I was about 12 years old, I think, I was walking back in the back of our property. We had a barn back there, and I heard this voice saying, Help! Help! That was exciting. That doesn't happen every day. So I ran around the other side of the barn, and I found my brother Bob, who was about eight years old at the time, and he was stuck in the mud. I don't know if you've ever been around horses, but when you get a lot of rain and uh, you got horses walking through there, they just create this real deep mud, kind of boot-sucking mud is what it is. And that's what happened to my brother. He went out with those rubber, old rubber boots with all those awful buckles, and he stepped in with one foot, and it went right up to the top of his boot. And so when he tried to pull his foot out, his sock came out, his shoe was still inside the boot, and the boot was just about entirely in the mud. And when I found him on the other side of the barn, he was standing with one foot up in the air, sort of like a kung fu move here, one foot in the mud, one foot up in the air, and he couldn't move. If he tried to pull the other one out, he was just going to sink deeper, and he was stuck there, and there was nothing that he could do. I've reminded my brother many times through the years that I saved his life that day because he would have died of starvation and exposure, surely, because he couldn't move. He couldn't get out of there. And I had to get like some boards and things so I could get out there without getting stuck myself. Otherwise, there would have been two of us with one foot up in the air yelling, help, help. And eventually, knowing my family, there would have been five of us yelling, help, help. <laughs> he, David says, he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire, and he set my feet on a rock. That picture is a picture of somebody who has sunk deep down and they can't rescue themselves. So picture that slimy pit. You've sunk into this slimy pit and the walls around you are straight up and not only are they, are they there, but they're slimy. You can't get any grip on them to climb up. And you're in the mud and the mire. So picture yourself kind of stuck up to about your waist in the mud and you're in the slimy pit and there is no possible way you're going to get yourself out. And what David says is, he lifted me out of the slimy pit. So look at the progression. I waited patiently for the Lord. First of all, what else is David going to do in the slimy pit? What else is my brother Bob going to do? He's going to wait patiently until I come get him because he can't get out. But God responds. He turned to me and he heard my cry and he lifted me out of the slimy pit. That's what God does when we wait patiently on him. When we try to take matters into our own hands and we try to, by our own furious activity, try to dig ourselves out of that pit, it only gets worse. And there are times when each one of us this summer are going to find ourselves in a situation where we can't fix it. We can't get out of it. And the thing that the most important thing for us to do at that moment is to do nothing. It'll go against all your instincts when you want to do something and solve the problem. The most important thing at that moment is to be still. Just like Eric Valley sitting on that rope, he had to be still and trust God. It's one of the hardest things for us to do is to wait patiently for the Lord. 
Another thing that happens when we wait patiently for the Lord is found in verse 3. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. One of the results of waiting patiently for the Lord is the joy that he gives to you. He puts a new song in your mouth. You know, God's mercies are new every day, every morning. He has something new to teach you. And often it's when, you're, when you finally surrender and you wait patiently for him that he teaches you something new when you're quiet enough to listen and to hear his voice. I think of Paul when he was thrown into prison and where everybody else is moaning and groaning because Paul had been beaten severely before he was thrown into prison and before he was shackled in prison. And instead, in the middle of the night, they heard him singing praise. Look what David says. He says, uh, he put a new song in my mouth, a, a hymn of praise to our God. That's what he did to Paul. Paul's in prison. He's locked up. There's nothing he can do except to wait patiently for the Lord. And when he was waiting patiently, God gave him a new song, and he began to sing praises. And look what it says. It says, many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. That's what happened to Paul in prison. All the other prisoners heard that, and many prisoners came to know Christ. The prison guard himself, the jailer, came to know Christ because he saw a joy in Paul that just was inexplicable. How can a person have joy in this situation? So some of you are going to find yourself in situations this summer where you don't feel necessarily joyful. Not a lot to be happy about. You're stuck and there's nothing you can do. And if you'll be still and let God put that new song in you and fill you with joy, there will be people who will notice that. Say, why do you have joy in this situation? The only explanation for that is Jesus Christ. Verse 4, he said, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to, uh, to false gods. You see, the, the attitude that he's talking about here is that after we pray about something for a while and God doesn't answer in our timetable, our tendency is to start to look for other alternatives. If God's not going to help me, maybe I can find somebody else who is. Uh, somebody else who will help me, or, or maybe I'll just have to take matters into my own hands and take care of it myself. That's human nature. If God's not going to take care of it, I'm going to find someone else. In the Old Testament, when a king was being attacked by a number of other countries who had kind of band together to attack him, he had a choice. He can trust God to defeat all of these enemies, or he can make an alliance with a powerful nation like Egypt and trust in the might of Egypt to bail him out of this battle. And that was often the, the, the test for these kings. Am I going to form an alliance with another nation, or am I going to trust God? And David says, uh, blessed are those who uh, trust in the Lord, and do not look to the proud and to those who turn aside to false gods. Don't look for other people to solve your problems. Uh, trust God in those things and, and wait for his timing. In verse 5, he says, Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done and the things you planned for us. Listen to those words again. Many, O oh Lord my God, are the wonders you have done and the things you've planned for us. No one can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. I, I picture a parent. Right now, school is letting out and the kids are going to be driving them crazy, and uh, they're going to be bored, and some parents are just going to turn the TV on and say, just sit there and watch TV. But a good parent is going to start making plans for their kids, and some of the parents are saying to the kids, all right, this is what we're going to do this summer. Well, this day we're going to go to the beach, and this day we're going to, go, uh, we're going to have a picnic, and this day we're going to go fishing, and they're making plans for their kids so that there's, there's things for them to do, plans that are going to be fun and are going to be full of joy. That's what David says. God is doing that for you. Do you picture God as your heavenly father making specific plans for you, thinking about you that tenderly like a parent who is making plans for you? He says many are the wonders you've done and the things you've planned for us. God has many things planned for you. He does. They're good things. You know, we know the verse. It says, I know the things I have planned for you. 
Uh, I've planned not to harm you, but to prosper you, uh, to give you a future. That God has, has planned many things for you. He says, many are the wonders you have done. Sometimes when we are stuck in the mud, we forget about all the wonders he'd done in the past. And all we can think about are our problems. But oftentimes when we are stuck in the mud and there's nothing we can do and we have to be still, one of the best things that you can do while you're being still is to think about all the wonders God has done in your life, to think about all the blessings he's done. This past week, I visited with Ruth, knowing that we were planning the funeral for her husband of 66 years. And she sat with me and recounted the blessings that God had poured out upon them over those 66 years. And here she is just days since her husband died, and just uh, 24 hours before his funeral. And she is just recounting the blessings of God, and that's all she could think about all the blessings that God had given them for 66 years. And she had peace, even in the midst of death, even in the midst of death of, her, of a loved one. One of the questions that David deals with in this psalm is the question, what does God want from us? What does God want me to do? I hear that question a lot. Does he want me... A lot of people think that the answer to the question is, he wants me to go to church... He wants me to pray. He wants me to give money. He wants me to read the Bible. After all, that's what preachers are always telling you to do, right? So you do these things, right? And so that's what God must want you to do. That's not what David says. Look at verse 6. It said, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire. We, by the way, I, I read this to you after we take the offering, you know, just a, as a point of reference. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. The ancient Jews became obsessed with keeping the law. They felt like if they did all of these things, then God would be pleased with them. So they would be very meticulous in their tithing. They would be very meticulous in being in church on the Sabbath. That was a must. We had to do it. And they would check off all the things, and they felt like if they did all of these things, God was going to be pleased with them. They had to pray certain times during the day and do all of these things. And Jesus would come along years later and look at some of these religious leaders and say, you are meticulous in keeping the law, but your hearts are far from me, says the Lord. Your hearts are far from me. You can do all the things that, that, the, that, that the Bible says to do, but your heart can be far from God. In the prophet, through the prophet Hosea, God said to his people, I don't want your sacrifices and your offerings. I want you to love me. I want you to know me. What we've said so many times, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with a living God. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you to know him and be known, to love him and be loved. That's what he desires. He wants your heart and he wants your heart to be close to him. And David says it's not the sacrifices and these things that he desires. And there's an interesting line in the middle of verse 6 where he says, but my ears you have opened. Some uh, in the NIV, they, sometimes they translate that pierced. My ears you have pierced. It works both ways. Uh, if it's saying my ears have been opened, he's saying sacrifices and offerings you did not require, but my ears have been opened. My I've, my understanding has been broadened. I've, I hear what you're saying. You want my heart, not my money. But this other translation, but my ears you have pierced, that goes back to an ancient tradition in, 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 each, in um, Israel where if a master were to set a slave free, every seven years they had to set these indentured servants free, and if the servant said, but... I, I like working for you, uh, you've treated me well, I want to be your servant, I will become your voluntary bond servant. Then the master would take him to the doorpost and they would take an awl used to punch holes in leather and they would pierce the ear of that servant. And that pierced ear was a sign that that person was a voluntary slave. That's how Paul, by the way, would describe himself in the New Testament. He would say, I am Paul, a bond servant to Jesus Christ. I'm a servant to God, not because I have to be, but because I want to be. 
And see, here's the clue to where we started, waiting patiently, being still. What God is calling for us is total surrender. That's what he wants. Not the money and not the obedience and all those other things. I mean, he, he wants obedience, but he wants your total surrender. He wants you to be his voluntary bondservant, to give your whole life to him, to place your whole self upon, upon the altar, and, and that's your reasonable service to offer yourself, your body as a living sacrifice. That's what he's asking for. So David decides that he can't keep this to himself. I'm sorry, I've, I've jumped to ahead a couple of verses here. Go back to verse 7, when David says, and this is David's surrender, by the way, after he said, my ears have pierced, David is giving himself to the Lord, and he does it with these words, verse 7, then I said, here I am, Lord, I have come. It is written about me in the scroll, I desire to do your will, O my God, your law is within my heart. That's what God wanted, not the law not to be external, but the law to be internal. The law is in his heart. And David is saying, here I come. It's like the song that we, has been sung in many Billy Graham song, rallies, which it says, just as I am, without one plea, O Lamb of God, I come to thee. Just as I am, I come, I come. That's what David is saying to the Lord, I come to you. I, I give my whole self to you. Your law is in my heart. I surrender all of myself to you. That's the secret of waiting patiently and being still, is absolute surrender. And with that, David is just filled with praise that he cannot keep to himself. And in the next two verses, he expresses that. He said, I proclaim righteousness to the, in the great assembly. Do not seal my lips. As you know, O Lord, I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and salvation. I do not conceal your love and your truth from the great assembly. David says, this is such great news, I can't keep it to myself. I'm telling everybody about it. Back in 2 Kings chapter 7, there's one of the more humorous passages in all, whole, all the Bible. When a, an enemy had surrounded one of the cities in, in Israel... And they surrounded the wall cities. They did what they called laid siege to it, which meant they cut off their food supply and they waited for them to be starved out. And the people inside the walls were starving so bad that they turned to cannibalism and it was just as gruesome as it could be. And outside the walls, there were a few beggars who normally would rely on the leftovers from the people inside, but there were no leftovers now. And they decided, we're going to die if we stay here. Let's surrender to the enemy. And if they kill us, we're going to die anyway. And if they make us prisoners, they'll feed us, so let's surrender. So these, uh, a few scrawny beggars start walking over you know, with their hands up to surrender to the enemy, and God causes this confusion in the enemy. He sees the dust coming up from these men walking up the hill, and they think that the, the a whole army is attacking them, and they're filled with panic, and they drop everything, and they run for their lives. The whole army runs for their lives, and they're running from these scrawny little beggars who don't have the strength to walk up the hill. <laughs> it's one of God's great practical jokes. <laughs> and when the beggars get to where the, the army had dropped everything and ran, they found tents. And they were tents full of food. The richest affair. And of course they did what you and I would do, what we're going to do in a few minutes with our cookout. They just started to stuff food in their face as fast as they can. <laughs> and then they said to themselves, what we're doing is not right. And they weren't thinking about Weight Watchers at the time. They said, what we're doing is not right. Because this is a day of good news and we're keeping it to ourselves. Right over there behind the walls are people who are starving to death and we are gorging ourselves in the food. We need to share this with them. And they went back and shared the good news. Well, that's what David is saying. This is such good news, I can't keep it to myself. I think that you and I as, as believers in Christ who have been forgiven, our sins have been forgiven, who have been given, filled with the joy and the peace of Christ, who has, have been rescued when we were in the, in the pit and in the mud and he's lifted us out of the pit. By the way, that pit for many people represents depression. It's the way so many people describe depression to me as being in this deep pit and they can't get themselves out. And when God lifts you out of that pit and puts you on firm ground, that's a time to rejoice, not to keep it to yourself, but to tell everybody about the work of God, that's, that he's done what nobody else can do. In verse 11, 
He says, Do not withhold your mercy from me, O Lord. May your love and your faithfulness always protect me. For troubles without number surround me. Do you feel like that sometimes? Troubles without number surround me. Maybe you feel more like the next line. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs on my head. My sins are more than the hairs on my head. And my heart fails within me. David says there's, there's two problems that are weighing him down in his life. One are just the troubles that come to everybody. Things like finances and health and broken relationships. This is gonna, troubles are going to come upon everybody. The second thing that weighs him down is his own sins. You see, sometimes the troubles come from the outside and sometimes the troubles come from the inside. His own sins are more numerous than the hairs on his head. And he says he's dragged away by his own sin. And then he says, speaking to the Lord, be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, aha, be appalled at their own shame. And may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. But as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. You see the last words of the psalm? Do not delay. This is the same David who started off by saying, I wait patiently. So he's kind of like us in the same time. I wait patiently, but come right now. <laughs> don't, don't delay any longer. So he ends by saying, come quickly, do not delay. You know, God knows us. He knows, he understands our anxious hearts. He knows that we want answers immediately. He doesn't always give us those answers because oftentimes it's in the waiting that we learn the deep lesson and the new lesson. So what is your crisis today? What is the crisis that you're going to come up against? For David, it was his enemies and it was that feeling of being sunk into a pit. And all of us, all of us experience a crisis at some point. What is your crisis? The Chinese, you know, they don't write with an alphabet like we do. They have characters. They have pictures that they draw. And so there's thousands and thousands of, of characters that they use to write. And when they write the word crisis, they combine two other words to create a word crisis. They place the word danger over the character for danger over the character for opportunity. Danger and opportunity. That's how they describe a crisis. When Eric Valley was hanging over that cliff taking pictures, he was in great danger, but he had an opportunity of a lifetime, and he cap captured these award-winning photographs. His crisis turned into an opportunity. I want you to think about the crisis that you're facing and the crisis that you're going to face. It just might be an opportunity for God to do something new in your life, to do something deeper in your life than he's ever done before, and it's going to come through the crisis, and it's going to happen if you wait patiently for the Lord, if you learn to be still. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we trust in you, but so often we put our trust in ourselves. So often we put our trust in others. Lord, you just tell us over and over again to be still and to wait patiently, and to rest in you. Father, just teach us, remind us. Help us, Lord, to learn how to wait patiently for you, how to truly be still and know that you are God. And Lord, I know that when we do that, you're going to reward us. You're going to lift us out of the pit. You're going to put our feet on firm ground. You're going to fill us with joy. Lord, give us opportunities to tell others about how you have done the impossible in our lives when we waited patiently for you. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand?